All right, guys, today we're going to be talking about what I look for in a modern bushcrafting and survival knife. Now, I've done some videos kind of similar to this or talking about, you know, like my favorite survival knife and stuff like that. But I thought that it'd be worthwhile to really talk about um, what I think of and what I really do try to aim for in modern bushcrafting and survival knives. And once again, you're going to see this more on the channel with future upcoming knives that will be featured on this channel and just continually as it goes. Now, it's also worth noting, especially in warmer climates and in warmer times of the year, I don't really particularly mind a full tanged knife. Something like the Survive Knives GSO uh, 5.1 is a really solid knife. This isn't to take away from the credibility, durability, and actual usability of many of these existing knives. I still have and continue to get knives that you guys request. I test them out and Survive has definitely been on that list. So definitely subscribe if you wanna see more uh, on the Survive GSO. But like I said, by and large, when it comes to actually acquiring knives for frontline use and actual knives that I, I genuinely believe believe like make really good survival and bushcrafting knives, they really have to fit into a kind of category that I found to be particularly useful as I continue to go outside, especially in the cold, and use knives. Um, for different applications such as survival and wilderness living training. So what do I look for in these knives? So previously, you know, in, in prior times, and once again, this isn't to take away from the effectiveness and usability of these knives, because I still absolutely love my Bark River Knives Bushcrafter. Will not be getting rid of it anytime soon. It's a fantastic knife. But by and large, like these are knives that I gravitated towards in the beginning. Like when I first started really getting into bushcrafting, these were kind of like the gold standard, um, things like the bushcrafter, things like the Pacific, things like the GSO, um, and just tons of knives out there, right? These were kind of like the standard. You had a full tank exposed, and this is what you looked for in a survival and bushcrafting knife, something that was durable, something that was stout, right? And what I've come to realize over the course of time is that while there is definitely some validity and truth to having a, an exposed full tang knife, uh, to having a thick blade, I think there have been a lot of kind of just sentiments that are unfounded when it comes to thinner, more... Um, thinner knives that aren't, you know, exactly full tang, that are still a very long tang in this handle, but you know, it's not an exposed full tang, like once again, the aforementioned Bushcrafter. And I think by and large, you know, a lot of people looked to those knives saying like, that is durability. Like if it's this, it's gonna just snap in half and it's gonna break. And I think that there's kind of been a two-toned lesson learned when it comes to durability in knives especially because realistically speaking even people like Joe X have gone out and broken you know many a full tanged knife right they he's pushed the two knives to their absolute limits and I think that that's one of the first things to really understand is that you know any knife regardless to whether it has an exposed full tang or it doesn't regardless to whether it's a quarter inch thick or a tenth of an inch thick every knife has a breaking limit and it's true that some knives some especially full tang knives are stronger than other other knives out there it's worth noting that truthfully speaking a lot of these thinner not exactly exposed full tang knives are very durable and what I would call realistically durable and I've said this before in other videos but I, I really do believe ardently that you know something like this scrapyard knife company WS 1021 is a perfectly fine, perfectly adequate knife for a lot of wilderness applications. And given that it is a much thinner blade stock, it's going to actually be really good at doing things like feather sticking, like um, carving, notching. And given, just depending on like what blade you get, you know, the trailing point may not always be the best uh, for certain types of applications like notching, but it's also not really gonna be that bad either. But what I also really enjoy is the full rubber handle on this. The rubber Rubberized handle is going to give you a ton of traction, a ton of comfort, and overall, when it comes down to it, you know, when you look at something like this Barky, you know, it's a polished micarta. So the micarta is good and all, but it's polished and it's going to be slick, especially if you get blood or water on your hands, you're going to be dealing with some serious traction issues. And that's where things like rubber do really well. And another thing too, like I said, in colder environments, you know, handles like 
these that have exposed um, tangs are going to be wickedly cold. You have bolts, these things are gonna get freezing. You know, obviously the steel is going to get freezing. These types of knives are going to be very uncomfortable to hold to hold for any duration or period of time. So it's important to take that in mind and be mindful depending on your time of year. But like I said, even in the summer and even in warmer climates, I've become more a fan of these uh, handles because once again, they also have the inverse effect of that. They don't exactly get hot in the summer. Now, of course, this is a black handle. If you leave it in direct sunlight, it'll get warm. But if you just leave this outside, just as it stands, it's going to really stay quite temperature neutral and so that's what I enjoy about these knives in particular is that once again, there's a good deal of temperature neutrality here where it's not really going to get very hot it's not going to get very cold and you're also not really sacrificing a lot of durability I think people really get hung up on the whole durability of their knife and that ends up influencing their choices in tools that are not going to be as effective or that there are tools equally as effective and they just won't test them out or they won't carry them they won't use them and once again i think there's also a lot of myths from a lot of people who have ill intentions honestly um, when it comes to smack talking things like the cold steel srk because this thing honestly perfectly functional. I've had people comment in like the comment sections below in videos where they're like, oh, I broke my cold steel SRK within five seconds of using it. And I'm like, really? Because I've had a bunch of cold steel SRKs, SRKCs, and I have tons of videos documenting my usage on these knives and never once have they failed, never have the handles come loose, never have really anything bad happen to them. And so once again, I'm not necessarily out here trying to push my cold steel SRK to its breaking point because I realized that the knife will break. You know, if you try to baton through a rock, you're probably going to break something. But at the same time too, like realistic wilderness and survival applications. And this is another thing that kind of blows my mind when I talk badly about, you know, things like the Gerber LMF is or LMF2 is that you know I'm just doing realistic wilderness applications like I'm not trying to go out and prove that this knife is bad it's just the moment you try to do any type of wilderness living and survival application the knife just fails right and so like I'm trying to be honest and objective with most of my experience and practice here with survival knives so I think it's an interesting concept but yeah there's definitely some other knives that will be coming onto the stage for especially bushcraft like some of these smaller guys um, you know that really are good I think the cold steel master hunter and CPM 3v and uh, the sand my version as well are really excellent options you can find both of them um, on sales for under a hundred dollars and so they're really solid options but also there's a lot of other really great options out there things like the Mora 511 craft line um, and there's just so many great budget offerings things like the Mora clipper you know these are really great knives and I I think on the channel, like going forward, I really do want to show you guys like, you know, these thinner knives like the WS, you know, um, 1021, things like the Clipper I've already shown and things like the craft line, I'll definitely be showing in more videos of like showing you how functionally durable a lot of these knives actually are. Because once again, I think the stigma has been there that, you know, in order to have a durable knife, it has to have, you know, a uh, three sixteenths to quarter inch tang, you know, it has to be full tang, it has to be this heavy, beefy knife. And, no doubt this GSO 5.1 is a heavy knife. Like, it's hard to, to really like express just how hefty this thing is, but this is a heavy knife. And so I think like there's been this mantra that you have to have a full tang heavy knife in the little things like this, you know, lightweight, um, not full tang or, you know, not exposed full tang, little WS 1021 with a, you know, 10th of an inch thick blade that, you know, initially you wouldn't think makes a lot of sense for the wilderness applications is actually surprisingly durable and surprisingly useful i mean like i said when i did my video my breakdown on the mora clipper that they're you know bringing back to life you know this is a sub 15 dollar knife um, in a lot of places and it honestly like there are pictures in the, the book bushcraft by morris kohansky showing him literally doing different wilderness tasks with this knife even talking about in knife craft which is a chapter of the book of how he durability tests knives and it's kind of insane he literally drives the tip of the knife into a tree and then stands on the handle and so knowing that the Mora Clipper can take that kind of abuse like we understand that these thin knives 
do functionally work well in survival applications. I just think that there's been a lot of pressure and a lot of I mean, a lot of pressure and kind of like marketing hype on these full tang built robust knives. And don't get me wrong, it's it's true that sometimes and in some applications having a thicker spine on a knife does help with the splitting action of you know breaking apart pieces of wood. So I'm not saying that there's nothing relevant in that it's all a sham or hoax. But to be fair, um, you know, genuinely speaking, it's like it might take you a whack or two more to get through a piece of wood with this, you know, tenth of an inch thick blade than this um, five thirty seconds of an inch blade. But at the same time, too, how much legitimate energy is that actually costing you? And so I think like the actual trade off here is far more minimal than most people give it credit. So I think that's a, another valuable kind of point or thing to keep in like the terms of relativity. So anyways, guys, hopefully you enjoyed this breakdown and kind of going over what I look for in modern bushcrafting and survival knives, because there's a lot more knives coming on the market, especially in the past 10 years that are, you know, rubberized handled knives. Knives, and so they're near full tang knives, but they're not exposed full tangs. And you know, like I said, the SRK is not new. The clipper's been around for decades, and there is documented use, even my own personal use with the clipper, um, that really show how good it is of a wilderness blade. And once again, maybe not baton through rocks with it, but do the actual things that you genuinely need to do in the wilderness. And so that's kind of my point of it. And hopefully, you guys enjoyed the video. As always, God bless.